And there we go. We here. <laughs> What's up, peoples? We get started a little bit early today. I got stuff to do. I got stuff to do, so we're going to go ahead and knock this thing out. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Who we got up in here? What up, Brianna? Julie? Is that Massive Man? What's going on with you? Malik? Life? Erica? Anthony? Tech? What's going on with you? Brianna? How you doing? Chrisia? Nice to meet you. Malik? Nice to meet you. Dollar Silver? You wasn't first to date, brother. Ha <laughs> ha. But you in here, zombie kitty. How you doing? I told y'all we was going to try to do this today, man. I think I'm streaming on Twitch as well. I think. I, I don't know for sure, but I can assume. Yeah, I'm streaming on Twitch. I'm playing. Let me go over to the uh, the multi-stream here. Oh, it ain't it ain't ready yet. It's still it's still loaded. But anyway. What up, AOK -okay Mafia? It's your boy, Artie and Kicks. It just like that. We back with another one. All right, y'all. So... It's time for some of the best for my buddy, Mr. Ballin. He does these top three stories that sound fake but are 100% real. We done covered a few of them. This is part six. And we're going to do one more part right after this one. I wanted to give you guys another upload to the channel today. And I wanted to give you all something on the gaming channel. But going to the chiropractor three times a week, it gets in the way of that. It gets in the way of that. So nothing for the gaming channel. I just uploaded a video for the second channel. So if you guys want to go over there and check that out um, a little bit after this, feel free. That is a different perspective is the name of that channel. And yeah, I wanted to give you all another video over here. But this live stream is going to have to be it for today, you guys. Then I got to get ready to go out the door. But anyway, we're about to get this party started. We already got about 400 people in here. This is crazy. I wasn't expecting this many people so soon. And we're early, earlier than expected, but like I said, I got to go out the door. Y'all know me, I've been enjoying roller skating lately, so, or rollerblading specifically, so I'm going to go to the skating rink and rollerblade later on. But we're going to go ahead and knock this out first. Y'all, let's get this party started. Y'all, this is top three stories that sound fake, but are 100% real. King Cole done dropped in here with another one. Thank you, brother, for the $5 don't know. Always in a live stream. I don't know how he make it all of them, but he does. That's somebody that got their post notification turned on and is working. It's working for him. Y'all, we're almost at a million subscribers. Make sure if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Mr. Bali, tell us a good story. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please get a job as a barista at the like button's favorite Starbucks just so you can give them a severely burnt cup of coffee every morning. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On February 17, 2004, shoppers inside of a massive Japanese superstore called Jusco in Wakachi City were suddenly aware of a loud commotion. When they went to investigate, they found a thin young woman with a young baby strapped to her chest grappling with an older man. Initially, on We've heard this story before. Is this the same video? Did we do this video already? Because I definitely remember this story. Okay, on to the next one, because I'm going to assume that we did this one already. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I know I've heard this story already. I'm assuming that maybe it was Mr. Ballin. We're going to go ahead and skip to the next video. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. Today we're going to look at three stories that demonstrate that. In the meantime, in between time, as he does his intro again, I'm going to see if I can find another Mr. Baller video. Samantha, thank you for the fat juicy don't know. What up, A-OK? -okay? Love your videos. Best reaction channel by far. Hope you have a good day, my guy. Uh, much love from AZ. Shout out to my folks out there. We here. That's right, Wilford. 
But before we get into today's story... I'm about to see if I can find this other Mr. Ballin' video. This is part 11. We tried to do part 6, but I think we've done that one already. If you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time you're in a very crowded parking lot and you see the like button driving around looking for a spot, flag them down and point to your car suggesting you're going to leave, and then go to your car and stand there fumbling for your keys for a few minutes, and then just walk away. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1918, during World War I, British soldier Henry Tandy found himself stationed inside of a trench in northern France. By this point, Henry was already considered a war hero, and he would go on to become the most decorated British soldier in World War I. But his awards are not what he is remembered for. On September 28th of that year, after a long day of fighting, Henry was propped up on the edge of his trench looking out towards the German line. It was dark and quiet and there was mist in the air, and at some point, Henry noticed a figure way off in the distance walking towards him. Henry instinctively raised his rifle, but he didn't pull the trigger. He wanted to make sure who he was shooting was his enemy, because it could be one of their own men who got wounded and was making his way back to the trench. True. And so Henry's looking down his gun, staring at the sky, waiting to figure out who he is, and after a few seconds, out of the mist walks a badly wounded German soldier, so it is his enemy, but he wasn't carrying a weapon, and he didn't appear to understand he was walking directly into Henry's sights. Henry aimed his rifle right at this German man's heart, but he didn't pull the trigger. And the man just continued to walk directly towards Henry until he got about 30 meters away, at which point he stopped and looked up and realized his mistake. But instead of trying to run away, he just stood there and stared at Henry, seeming to accept the fact that he was about to die. Now, Henry had shot many men during the war so far, but he just could not bring himself to shoot this unarmed, wounded German who just looked kind of pathetic. And so with Henry's gun still up, he glanced to his left and he glanced to his right to make sure nobody was watching, none of his comrades were gonna see this, and then he lowered his gun. And then Henry and this German man just stared at each other for a while until the German man just nodded his thanks, turned around, and wandered back into the mist out of sight. The man Henry had just saved was Adolf Hitler. What? You gotta be shitting me! <laughs> you should've shot that motherfucker! You should've shot him, bro! You could've saved so many lives if you shot that motherfucker! Oh my god! I was like, yo, something telling me he should shot this fool. I don't know who this fool is, but he's on the opposite side. He's on the other side. He's an enemy. Shoot him. Even though he looks pathetic and helpless, shoot him. It was Adolf Hitler. That's crazy. That's crazy. That was Hitler before he became Hitler. In the early See, this is what I'm talking about, man. This is why I love Mr. Ballin, bro. Get to hear these amazing stories that I would have otherwise never heard. In the morning hours of June 10th, 1994, Deborah Hoyt suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. She and her husband were staying with relatives in Sacramento, California, and they were supposed to be there for the next couple of days. But as she was sitting there, she had this overwhelming urge to want to leave right then and there and head back to their home in Lake Tahoe. Because she didn't really know what to make of this overwhelming feeling, she shook her husband awake and told him about it. She thought that maybe something was wrong. And he said, you know what? You probably just had a bad dream and you're kind of waking up still half in your dream. It's not a big deal. Just go back to bed. I'm sure everything is totally fine. And in the morning, if you still want to, I'd be happy to leave. And so Y'all stupid, man. Y'all stupid. Yeah, I just knew I was going to have a crazy reaction. I didn't know what the freak that was going to be. Deborah said, yeah, you're right. I'm totally overreacting. I'm sure it was just a dream. And she laid back down to try to go back to sleep. But as she laid there, that sense of dread that something was wrong and that she had to leave right now, it was just growing and growing and growing until she just jumped out of the bed. She's just standing in the room and she says to her husband, honey, we got to go right now. I don't know what's wrong, but we got to go right now. Fascinating. Fascinating. She has this this feeling, this deep gutted feeling that something isn't right and that they need to leave. I've had that feeling before. 
and her husband did not want to go. And he said, come on, Deborah, get back in bed. It's not a big deal. But she was adamant. She said, get out of bed. We're leaving right now. And so begrudgingly, her husband said, okay, we'll leave right now. And so the two of them hastily packed up and then went downstairs and left a note for their relatives explaining their absence. And then they got in their car and they drove off. After a little while, the couple reached a very dangerous section of their journey back home. It was called Bullion Bend, and it was a very windy road up in the mountains where one wrong turn and you're going flying down the side of a mountain. After driving through this area for about 15 minutes, they rounded a particularly sharp turn, and as soon as they made the turn and could look down the road, Deborah, who was in the passenger seat, she saw up ahead on the right, off the side of the road several feet, something that was just lying there on the side of the road. She didn't know what it was. She thought it was maybe a bag or some trash or maybe a dead animal. And at first she was just gonna dismiss it. But as her husband drove closer and closer to it, the light began to illuminate it and she looked at it and couldn't really discern what it was until they were right next to it. And she looked out her window and she noticed it was a woman's body, a woman who had no clothes on, who was just lying there totally motionless. And Deborah immediately turns to her husband and says, honey, I just saw a dead woman on the side of the road. And her husband immediately is kind of panicked and doesn't slow down. He just keeps driving and says, hey, you know, should we stop? Should we turn around? I mean, maybe she's not dead. Maybe we can help her. But Deborah, maybe you can call 911 and mind your business. I'd be like, um, bring dispatch. Yeah, we we're on um whatever name this street is. They they know the name. We're, yeah, we we just passed what looked like a, a naked woman on the side of the road laid out somewhat lifeless um that's none of our business so we just wanted to relay the message to you but yeah we gonna go ahead and keep driving home that's what i would do you know i'm not i'm about i'm not about to play with these folks love your videos i legit biz watch them every day <laughs> lol keep up the amazing work thank you brianna appreciate you guys i get so many people messaging me saying that they binge watch my videos on a daily that's why i post so much man because i know there's people out there that appreciate the channel that much so thank you guys seriously thank you guys so much but at this point is now terrified and she's saying no keep going don't go back i bet it's a trap someone probably put her there and they're gonna lure us in and they're gonna attack us if we try to stop and help her and so in this kind of chaotic frenzied reaction that deborah and her husband are having they decide that their best course of action is just to drive on and find the next payphone and call the police and it just so happened that less than a quarter of a mile away was a ranger station with a phone and so they pull into the parking lot and deborah calls the police the police how long ago was this? They ain't got a cell phone? They ain't got a, Wait, this must have been a while ago then. Tell her to wait inside of her car and they'll be out in a couple of minutes and they're gonna need her to bring them up to where she saw this body. So a couple of minutes goes by, the police show up, and they tell them to drive back up the road, but stop about 200 yards short of where you believe this woman's body is. And so Deborah and her husband, they get back in the car, they drive back up the road where they came from, and right at this point where the road turned very sharply is where Deborah knew on the other side of this turn would be this body. And so they pulled over on the side of the road, the police came up on their side, and they said, yep, right around the corner, you're gonna find her lying on the ground on the left side. And so Deborah and her husband are just sitting in the car watching as the police go up they make that turn and they kind of disappear out of sight and then they see their spotlight moving around on the other side of this turn and so they figure okay they're looking for the body but after several minutes the police came back down the road and they stopped next to Deborah's car and they said you know what guys we didn't see anything up there there what? wasn't a body there wasn't anything out of the ordinary and Deborah would say to police I'm not lying I know what I saw it was a woman's body right there in front of me I know it. it's right over there and they would tell her that we believe you, but we can't do anything because there's nothing up there. And so they told Deborah and her husband to just head home, and they did. After Deborah and her husband took off and were gone, the two responding officers drove back to their police station, and once they were inside, they began speculating about what Deborah might have seen. And as they were talking, another officer came into the station, a guy by the name of Rich Strasser, and he overhears them, and he goes over, he's intrigued, and he asked them, you know, what happened? What did you see? And they explained to him that this woman, Deborah had spotted a supposed dead woman's body up on Bullion Bend. And as soon as he heard Bullion Bend, Rich remembered that just a couple of days ago, they had received a missing person report of a young woman named Christine Skubish and her young son named Nick, who had gone missing, and the last place they had been seen was up on Bullion Bend. 
And so Rich wondered if maybe there was a body up there and maybe it was Christine's. And so the next morning, Rich got up early and he headed out to Bully and Ben. And when he reached the exact spot where Deborah had claimed to have seen this dead woman's body, he found a children's shoe. And so he stopped his car, he got out, he picked the shoe up and he's looking around and he's looking for anything else that's out of the ordinary, but there's nothing on the road. There's no skid marks. There's no other debris. There's no other clothes. There's nothing. And so he walks over to the guardrail that overlooks this very steep embankment and he looks down the other side and at first all he sees is just trees everywhere but as he's looking he thinks he sees more clothing farther down the mountain and so he climbs over the guardrail and he very carefully maneuvers his way down and after only a couple yo this sounds like what would happen in a movie like exactly what would happen in some type of horror movie this is crazy like the police officer overhears a story he's able to connect it to a prior incident that happened on the same street then he goes back there the next day to investigate the area. As soon as he pull up to the spot where the lady said she saw the girl, he gets out the car. He sees what looks like is a child's shoe. He starts to scan the area to see if he can find any other signs of debris or clothing or whatever it may be. And then he looks over the guardrail and see that there looks appear to be other clothes. I'm like, this sounds just like what would happen in the movie. This is crazy. What up, Yanni? Happy hump day to you as well. There was another message in here I saw. Susan, thank you so much for the $2 dono. It's much appreciated. Shout out to my two moderators that I can see in here. Thank you guys for helping us out today. We're at 1,200 live viewers. Thank you all. Well, seconds, he reaches a clearing in the branches and the trees, and he can see down to where the train kind of levels off. And right down there is a smashed up red four-door sedan. It was the same type of car that Christine Skubish had been driving when she went missing. And so Rich ran down the mountain, following debris all the way to this wrecked car. He goes around to the driver's side and he looks inside and there in the driver's seat is Christine Skubish. And unfortunately she was deceased. And then on the passenger seat is her son, Nikki. And he is alive, but barely. He had gone five days without food or water. And oh my God. Oh my God, what? No way. Poor kid, he's sitting there right next to his mom. His mom is deceased. He's been there five days and he's struggling to hold on to life. Oh my God, that is so sad. Poor kid. But what's fascinating is the ghost of this woman, of this mother, keeps appearing, or at least appeared that one time for the girl laid out on the road naked to draw attention to that spot so that someone can find her son. That's what I feel is happening. Wow. Somebody in here, birthday. Whose birthday is it? Happy birthday to you. Doctors would say when Rich found him, he probably only had about one, maybe two hours before he would have died as well. <sighs> Authorities believe Christine fell asleep at the wheel and she drove off that embankment. Oh. Initially, Rich believed Deborah must have seen Christine when she was driving through the mountains and saw that woman on the side of the road. After her accident, Christine must have gotten out of her car and then climbed up that embankment and then laid on the road hoping someone would see her. And then when no one stopped for her, she went back down to her car where she ultimately died. Hmm. I thought about that. I thought about that. But I, that, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Why would she get out of the car, climb up the embankment, not bring her child up there with her? So that they can both be found. Was the woman in the car naked or did the woman have on clothes? Why would she not just be, you know, sitting upright or alert or at least in a sit sitting up in a position, you know, up against the bankment so that people can like spot her? Why would she just be laid out? I, I don't, I'm confused. But according to the coroner, that would have been impossible because when Christine crashed off the road, she died on impact five days before Deborah saw that woman on the side of the road. 
so it could not have been Christine. To this day, no one knows for sure who or what Deborah saw on the side of the road. See, so that goes back to my initial theory was that she was the ghost. She was the ghost of herself and she went up there, got on the road, laid out naked, trying to get someone's attention so that someone can go down there and save her child. That makes more sense. But it is objectively true that Rich only investigated Bully and Bend and found Nikki alive because of Deborah's police report about this dead woman on the side of the road. Right. And Deborah was only on that road because she'd had this totally weird middle of the night urge to suddenly leave a relative's house and drive up into the mountains. You see? Something she had never felt before and didn't really know how to explain. Wow, think about that. Think about that. It was almost as somebody was um, virtual signaling to this woman so that that woman can be the one to initiate the finding of this girl's son. Wow. So either this is an extremely strange set of circumstances or Nikki had a guardian angel. Wow, that is fascinating. Of course, Candy Girl, happy early birthday to you. What you doing for the birthday, girl? Happy early birthday. June 10th, it's coming. Wait, somebody in my family, oh, my aunt. My aunt's birthday was this month. In early 1980, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't like that stuff, this is just what it is. Three residents of the Cranley Gardens apartment complex in North London began complaining about their drains being clogged up. Initially, their landlord was dismissive and said, oh, it's just an old building, it's old plumbing, and that's why it's slow. But eventually, the landlord conceded and asked a plumber to come out and have a look. And so, on the evening of February 8th, an experienced plumber named Mike came out to Cranley Gardens, and after learning what the complaints were, he went around to the side of the building, and he opened up a drain cover to have a look inside. As expected, when he shined his light down, he saw wads of hair and napkins and other things kind of mashed together, clogging up. See, somebody just caught one of these on the website. I'm going to be shouting you guys out. Just copping stuff on the website at the end. V-Man, what's going on? I see you in here, player. The pipes. And so he reached in and he began pulling the stuff out and put... Oh, it was Sally's birthday. Shout out to Sally. Happy birthday to you. You hanging out with your boy on the birthday? That's I see you. That's what's up. Hey, we got about 1,400 people in here. I'm going to go back a little bit the building and he opened up a drain cover to have a look inside as expected when he shined his light down he saw wads of hair and napkins and other things kind of mashed together clogging up the pipes and so he reached in and he began pulling the stuff out and putting it in a bucket right next to him and then after he had cleared the majority of the obstruction he reached his arm all the way into this pipe to feel around to see if there was anything in there that he just couldn't see and at some point as he was reaching when his arm was almost completely into this pipe his hand hit a major blockage and so he moved his fingers around to try to feel what it was, but he couldn't tell. It was something that was fairly soft, but there were some hard things inside of it, like sticks or rods. So he grabbed a handful of this blockage and he pulled his arm back out of the pipe. He opened it. What is Mr. Ballin be getting these pictures from, man? He be getting like the most perfect pictures to kind of paint an imagery inside of your mind of what could be happening. His hand and what he was holding looked like ground meat but it wasn't any meat he'd ever seen before. And inside of this fleshy substance looked like little bits of bone. Now- Oh, that was a person. Mike had cleared many pipes before and he had never seen meat be the reason for a blockage. Yeah. And so this whole situation just seemed really strange and he decided, you know, it's late. I'll just come back tomorrow with my supervisor so he can see what this is too. So Mike puts the cap back on the drain pipe and he walks out from behind the building back out towards his truck parked on the road. And as he's walking, two of the residents of this complex come out and they say, hey, did you fix the blockage? You know, what was it? And Mike would say, no, he hadn't. And then he just kind of blurted out that there was meat in the pipes. That was what was causing the blockage. And then one of these two residents says, well, I bet people are just flushing their Kentucky Fried Chicken down the drains. That's what's causing it. And Mike looked at him and he was like, yeah, maybe. And then he just turned around, got in his truck and he drove away. Early the next morning, Mike and his supervisor came back to Cranley Gardens and they went around to the side of the building. They undid that cap. And then Mike reached down inside expecting to feel this blockage, but where it should have been, there was nothing. Somebody had cleared the pipes. 
And so Mike and his supervisor are looking at each other and Mike is like, there's no way that cleared on its own. Someone had to have come out here and cleared it, but I don't know why they would have done that and still had us come out. Let the men decide, you know what, maybe by chance it did just kind of slip through and cleared itself. So let's just continue the process and make sure each of the apartment buildings, their individual pipe is unobstructed. And when they checked these pipes, they found all of them were clear except for one, apartment number 23, whose pipe was blocked up with more of this meaty substance. Mike and his partner were already very suspicious of the fact that someone had snuck out here in the middle of the night and cleared the pipe, probably. They didn't know if that happened, but it seemed likely. Yeah. And now they're finding more of this weird meat substance coming from a particular apartment. And so the whole situation just seemed off. And so they told the landlord that they were not gonna touch this. Somebody else had to come out and deal with this. And the landlord, after finding out there was meat jammed in the pipes, got really freaked out and called the police. The police showed up, they pulled this meat substance out of the pipes and they sent it to a mortuary where a pathologist looked at it and said this is meat it's human meat and in particular the stuff that was pulled out of apartment number 23's pipes is that of a human neck so the police go back to Cranley Gardens, they go up to apartment number 23, they knock on the door, and when the door opens, they're hit with this overwhelming stench of just rotting flesh. And standing in the doorway of this apartment, the owner of the apartment, is this guy who's in his late 30s, early 40s, who introduces himself as Dennis Nielsen. And they say, hey Dennis, can we have a look around your- Now, nah, real photo, this is the actual guy that was in that apartment, man. Sheesh. Oh, hold on, I can't tell. Samantha, is that a new? Is it, was that a new dono? Lloyd, shout out to you, new channel member in the house. Kevin, thank you for the twenty dollar dono, y'all. We are in here. We got almost fifteen hundred people in the live stream. That's what's up. Let me see what people talking about on Twitch. Yes, now Twitch is up. Apartment, and he says, you know why? And they say, well, we found human remains in your pipes. And Dennis immediately says, oh my goodness, I can't believe that. That's horrible. Don't cap, Dennis. You capping, bro? but the police are not buying it. They say, you know what, Dennis, tell us where the rest of the body is. And at this, Dennis suddenly went expressionless, emotionless, and he just turns around and he points into his bedroom and he says, it's in two plastic bags in my closet. And so before the police go into his apartment to go inspect these bags, they say, Dennis, are there any other bodies in your apartment that we should know about? And Dennis sighs and he looks up to the ceiling and says, yeah, there's about 15 or 16 here. So Story. It goes way back. I'd love to tell it to you, get this off my chest, and I'll do it at the police station. So after Dennis was arrested and brought to the station, he told them his horrible story. It had all started five years earlier in 1978 when Dennis was 33. He was at a pub having some drinks by himself when a teenager came into the bar and attempted to buy an alcoholic drink. And he was denied service. And so Dennis pulled him aside. And Shadow King Chris on Twitch says he looked like somebody that would do that. 100 said hey i'd be happy to give you a drink at my apartment it's right down the road and the young man whose name was steven was very excited about this and said great let's go once they arrived back and they were up in dennis's apartment the pair had lots of drinks and they were having fun and laughing and then at some point the pair climbed into bed together the next morning when dennis got up his new friend steven was still sleeping right next to him and he had this sudden overwhelming sense of dread because he knew as soon as steven woke up he would see this as a one night stand and he would just leave he would not stick around and remain friends with Dennis. And Dennis just did not like that idea. He wanted Stephen to stay. And so he looked on the ground next to the bed and he saw the necktie that Stephen had been wearing was on the ground. And so he got on the ground, he grabbed the necktie, he fashioned it into a noose, and then he climbed back on the bed, got on top of Stephen's chest, and he looped the tie around his neck and then he pulled it as tight as he could. This man is beyond sick in the head. He needs to see some professional help. He goes to a bar, whatever. He meets a guy. They hit it off. They go back home. They're hitting each other. <laughs> this is serious. Let me stop laughing. He wakes up the next morning and feel this overwhelming sense of dread. Oh man, this was a one night stand. I really like this person. I don't want them to leave. So I'm going to kill him? 
what sense does that make? Now there is zero opportunity of this person continuing to be a part of your life. You ended their life. You didn't even give them a chance. You made this assumption, this idea in your head that this person is not going to want anything else to do with you after this, this one night stand. You don't even know where that person's mind is. Maybe they would have wanted to continue a relationship with you. But you didn't give yourself a chance, nor did you give that person a chance. You just went to the worst case scenario. Oh, I'm just going to end this person. What? What? Put him under the jail. Put him under the jail. And as soon as it was tight, Dennis would tell police that Stephen came alive and he began reaching for his neck and kicking Dennis as hard as he could, but he just can't get it off. And at some point, Dennis said Stephen just seemed to give up. He looked up at Dennis and knew he wasn't going to get this off and that Dennis was determined to kill him. And so Stephen allowed himself to go limp and then he slouched over. And as soon as that happened, Dennis said he relaxed. But as he's looking at Stephen, he realized he wasn't dead. He was just unconscious. And so Dennis goes into the kitchen and he gets this huge plastic bucket and he fills it up with water and he sets it in the middle of his kitchen floor. And then he gets a bunch of kitchen chairs and he lines them up like a table right in front of this bucket of water. And then he drags Stephen's body into the kitchen and he lays him on his back on these chairs, but make sure his head is not resting on the chair. His head is kind of dangling off the back of these chairs. And then he grabbed that bucket of water and he slid it right underneath Stephen's head. And then Dennis got on top of the chairs, on top of Stephen, and then he pressed the young man's face straight down so his head went backwards until his mouth and his nose were under the water. And Dennis held him like that until Stephen regained consciousness, but again, he didn't fight it, he knew he was doomed, and after several minutes, the bubble stopped coming to the surface and Stephen was dead. Dennis pulled his victim off of the chairs, he brought him into the living room and he sat him on a chair, and then Dennis went into the kitchen and he made himself a cup of coffee and he smoked some cigarettes, and then he just stood in the doorway and looked at Stephen's body. And he would tell police it was a very bizarre experience because Stephen still looked like he was alive. In fact, Dennis would try talking to him as if he was going to talk back, but obviously he didn't. At some point, Dennis realized, you know, the life he had before he killed Stephen was now over. He had a new life and he didn't really know how to handle it. And so the first thing he thought to do was to clean Stephen. So he took Stephen's body and he brought him into the bathroom and he gave him a very long bath, cleaned his body, cleaned his hair. And then afterwards he got him out, he dressed him and put him into his bed. And then Dennis climbed into bed with him and laid with him. And he would tell police as he laid there, he suddenly felt overjoyed. Stephen was not going to leave him. He was going to stay here as long as Dennis wanted him to. This man, this man is sick. Oh my God. What? That is, oh my, I can't even fathom. There is no rationalizing a mindset like that. This sounds like a man that has been sheltered with little to no social skills. What? This man has screws in his head loose. After laying with him for some time, Dennis realized he had to find a way to hide Stephen's body in his apartment so no one could find him. And so he left his apartment and he went to a hardware store where he got an electric knife and a big storage bin. He brought them back to his apartment and as he was about to cut Stephen up, he just couldn't go through with it. So instead, he just climbed into bed and took a nap next to Stephen's body. When he got up again, he moved Stephen's body onto the ground in his living room and covered him with a blanket. And then he went and made dinner and then sat in his chair in the living room right next to this body on the ground and watched TV for a while. When he was done watching TV and eating, he looked at the body on the floor and realized, you know, he really hadn't made any progress in terms of hiding him somewhere in his apartment. And that's when he remembered he had a loose floorboard in his apartment. And so he went over to the loose floorboard, he pulled it up and he saw there was a space under the floors. And so he pulled a couple more boards up and then 
he grabbed Stephen's body and he attempted to force him down into the space. But by now, Stephen's body had begun to stiffen up from rigor mortis. Specifically, his arms were outstretched like a Y over his head. And so as Dennis is trying to force him down in there, his arms were not allowing him to go down into that small space. So Dennis took Stephen's body and he propped him up against the wall in his bedroom. So the body is against the wall, rigid, standing up with its arms up over its head and Stephen's eyes were still open. And then after that, Dennis just got in bed and fell asleep. So all night, this corpse is staring at Dennis in his bed. And then the next- Woo! Woo! You know an individual would have to be sick. This is real. An individual would have to be so sick in the head that they would be perfectly okay with being able to sleep at night with a corpse standing straight up with his arms in the air, wide eyes wide open, staring right at you while you slept. You know, the scary thing is, the scariest part is that there are people out there in the world right now that are capable of doing stuff like this, but they have yet to been caught. That's sad. This is insane. Next morning when Dennis got up, there was Steven still up against the wall with his hands in the air looking down at him. Dennis grabbed Steven's body and put it on the ground and he began yanking and jerking and pulling on each of Steven's arms until they were pinned down by his side. And then after that, Dennis started working on his legs and his hips and he began contorting him until he was small enough that he could pack him down under his floor. And then once he was under there, he just put the boards on top and went about his daily life. And for the next couple of days, he totally forgot about Steven. But a week after putting him under the floor, Dennis decided he missed Steven and he wanted to see him again. And so That's what I'm talking about right there. You idiot! That's what I'm talking about right there. That was my point. You didn't give him a chance. You didn't think for a second that if you were to end his life, then now he's no longer a part of yours. Now you missed the fool. So now you got to go and dig him back up so you can see him again. Evil or evil I just can't I just can't put myself in that frame of mind wow so one night he opened up the floorboards he looked down and there was Steven and Dennis would say it looked like he was dirty so he pulled him out of the floor and he gave him another bath and then after he had of course he's dirty fool clean steven he pulled him out of the water he dried him off and he put him in the chair and then dennis took a bath himself in the same water he had just used to clean steven after a long soak in this tub dennis finally got out he toweled himself off he redressed steven and then he forced him back onto the floorboards and covered him up again and he would remain there for the next seven months until dennis finally decided to dispose of him by burning him in a bond fire outside of their apartment building and then after the body was completely incinerated and gone dennis remembered thinking i can't believe i just got away with murder and so he would do it again and again and again killing at least 15 young men from north london all by strangulation or by drowning or a combination of the two and after he killed them he would keep them stashed in his apartment for months at a time in his closet in his cabinets in his bed under the floors all over his apartment he had these bodies and while these bodies were in his apartment he liked to period periodically take them out to spend time with them. He would tell police he found corpses to be beautiful. He was fascinated by them. But eventually in night
it's said that once you end someone's life, it forever changes you. That it's almost as if you've become soulless and the desire for wanting to do it again overwhelms you. Anyone that's watching me right now, don't get any ideas. Don't become that person. But too often do I hear of cases like this where it's either done purposefully or by a mistake. But they get this hunger to want to do it again. What's fascinating is the fact that this guy had enough social skills and was socially inept enough to be able to lure in multiple men or young boys, whatever it was that he was going after. He had the ability to gain their trust enough to get them to even come back to his home or to go out with him privately outside of their initial social setting why wasn't that enough for him to be able to think huh you know what maybe i could have a relationship with someone it's almost as if he repeatedly had that thought of oh this is a one night stand they're gonna leave me after This is pure evil. What do you do with someone like this? Do you put them in prison? Isolation? Let them suffer for the rest of their life? Or do you give them the death penalty? And not prolong it? Let it happen immediately. What do you do? I feel like there isn't a crime. I mean, I feel like there isn't a, a sentence that is harsh enough for the crimes that this man has committed. You know what I mean? I would feel like, like an episode of um, Black Mirror. There's an episode of Black Mirror where this girl committed a heinous act and you don't know it in the beginning when you're watching it. You just see so many people recording her and people chasing after her, trying to kill her, but no one is trying to help. Just everyone is recording. Everyone is recording. And she's so lost, she's so confused. And by the end of it, you realize that she had done this thing, her and one other person had done something so horrible. So they keep putting her back and replaying it over and over so that she can relive that same thing that she had done to someone else. I feel like that's the sort of thing that would need to happen to this guy. He would have to relive the torture and the torment that he had conflicted upon these innocent men. This is crazy. 1983, he had so many bodies stashed all over his apartment that he knew he really needed to expedite getting rid of them. And so he began cutting them up and trying to. Yeah, um, American Amy. Yeah, it was her and her boyfriend that had done something in Black Mirror. I, I remember that forced them down his drain, which eventually clogged the pipes. And so when Mike the plumber showed up and discovered this meaty substance in the pipes and Dennis overheard him talking about it, that night after Mike was gone, Dennis had gone outside and attempted to clear the rest of the remains from the pipes. But he wasn't aware there were still remains stuck in the pipe that led to his specific apartment. Dang. Dennis Nielsen confessed. Dang, he, he cleared out all the pipes except for the one to his own home. Ain't he a fool? 
night after Mike was gone, Dennis had gone outside and attempted to clear the rest of the remains from the pipes, but he wasn't aware there were still remains stuck in the pipe that led to his specific apartment. Dennis Nielsen confessed to killing 15 young men and attempting to kill at least seven others, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Dennis never showed any remorse, nor did he show any desire to want to be free again. He actually said he deserved to be in jail for what he did. In 2018... Y'all right. Y'all 100% right. He does look like somebody that would do this stuff. I hate to say that. I hate to say that. But he does. Wow. Hold on. He said something else died and attempted to clear the rest of the remains, Dennis Nielsen confessed to killing 15 young men and attempting to kill at least seven others. Y'all remember that video that we did recently on the, um, on what crazy looks like and, and what people faking crazy looks like? You remember the one guy that had committed that crime of killing a dude that was, he Proclaimed he needed him to take him, give him a ride to Walmart. But how that dude was able to sit there and tell the investigator everything that had happened as if it was perfectly okay. He had no remorse. That's what this dude did. He confessed to the crimes with zero remorse for what he did. Insanity. He's actually insane. And he was sentenced to life in prison. De That's not good enough. He needs to be tortured. Dennis never showed any remorse, nor did he show any desire to want to be free again. He actually said he deserved to be in jail for what he did. In 2018, Dennis Nilsson would die in prison at the age of 72. Dang. So that was, was a while ago when that happened. He died at 72 years old in prison. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's video, let us know in the comments. Wow. In Marie? Is that how you say your name? Thank you for the dono. Y'all, we got one more video. Now I got to get up out of here. This story was insane. Sociopath, yes. Most certainly. Y'all, this video right here, it's the last video. I slick got to use the bathroom. Y'all mind if I go use the restroom real quick? Would y'all wait for me? We got about 1,800 people in here. Make sure y'all hit that like button for your boy. I'm going to go use the restroom real quick, and then I'll be back. This is crazy. This is crazy. back y'all this video right here is this man and 39s huh secret shock the world mature audience only uh oh uh oh i thought the last video was bad this is about to be crazy let's check this out for over 20 years a person in austria kept a horrible secret and in 2008 that secret was inadvertently revealed and it shocked the world but before we get into...
All right, so he said in 2000, wait, what? 2000 what? Austria kept a horror. A person in Austria kept for over 20 years, a person in. Oh, for over 20 years, a person in Austria kept a horrible secret. And then in 2000, what, eight? Austria kept a horrible secret. And in 2008, that secret was inadvertently revealed and it shocked the world. But this is gonna be crazy. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we. Yeah, man. If you're a, if you're a supporter of my channel, make sure y'all go hit up Mr. Ballin and hit the subscribe button for that man, dude. He's about to hit three million subs in like one year. Dude's crazy. Hey, we lost a hundred people. Y'all suck. Do and we upload three <laughs> or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, invite the like button to come over to your house for a family dinner party, and then proceed to serve them a severely oversalted dish. But before they take a bite, be sure to tell them you're so proud of your cooking and you can't wait to get their feedback. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. On August 28, 1984, an 18-year-old girl named Elizabeth went missing. On the first day she was gone, her friends and family went out looking for her, but they couldn't find her. The following day, when she still hadn't shown up and no one had heard from her, her parents went to the local police station in their Austrian town of Amstetten, which is about an hour west of Vienna, and they reported her missing. The police launched an initial search of the town and the surrounding areas, but after several weeks, they had found nothing that connected to Elizabeth and where she might have gone. A month after she had been reported missing, her parents came back to the police station, except this time they were carrying a note they say they received in the mail from their missing daughter. It was postmarked from a town that was about two hours west of Amstetten, and in this note, Elizabeth writes directly to her parents, and she tells them that she had grown tired of living with them, and she did not want them to come looking for her, and if she discovered they were looking for her, she would just flee the country. After the police read the note, they asked the parents if they thought it was real, if this was a legitimate letter from their daughter, and they said, yeah, they think it is. And then after that, her father, Joseph, suggested that maybe his daughter had run off to join a cult. That was something he thought she was getting into before her disappearance. Mm. After the parents left the police station, the police began conducting interviews with other family members and friends of Elizabeth to see if it was possible that she might have run off to join a cult. And virtually everyone they spoke to said, absolutely not. There is no way she ran off to join a cult. That just wasn't her. She was a quiet, reserved person, and they had never heard her talking about a cult or anything that even resembled a cult. These answers left the police feeling very suspicious of the whole situation, and so they decided to look into the young woman's history to see if there was some other reason she might have run off. In their research, they discovered that Elizabeth was one of seven siblings that all lived together with their parents, Joseph and Rose Marie. Joseph was a successful electrical engineer and real estate developer who was well-liked and respected in town, and Rose Marie had gotten married very young at the age of 17, and she had stayed home to take care of the kids. By all accounts, from the outside looking in, they were a very ordinary family. But as the police began to dig deeper and deeper into their history, they discovered there were some big problems behind closed doors. Despite his friendly, outward public appearance, Joseph was actually a ruthless authoritarian when he was home alone with his family. At night, when he came home from work, his wife and his kids would immediately stop whatever they were doing and go silent in hopes they might avoid a beating. The only member of the family that seemed willing to stand up to Joseph was Elizabeth, and she and her father would frequently get into screaming fights, and then as punishment for these fights, Joseph would not only beat his daughter, he would also prevent her from seeing her friends for long periods of time, and he would go through her personal things like her diary. Their toxic relationship finally came to a head when Elizabeth finally ran away from home two years prior to her most recent disappearance. She made it all the way to Vienna before authorities caught up to her and brought her back home. Upon learning about this earlier disappearance, the police became convinced that the most recent disappearance was yet another attempt to escape her abusive and controlling father. And so the police decided that this was more of a family affair and they didn't push the investigation further. A year went by and neither the police nor her family heard anything from Elizabeth and so her case was closed. But 24 years later, a seemingly unconnected event broke her case wide open. 
what? On April 19th, 2008, a 19-year-old named Kirsten was rushed to the hospital in Amstetten. Her skin was so pale it looked almost transparent. She was unconscious and suffering from seizures as well as lung and kidney failure. Oh, the doctors wow. were able to stabilize her by putting her into a medically induced coma, mm -hmm. but after running a litany of tests, they couldn't figure out what was causing her to have this medical condition, and so they were not able to treat her effectively. I, I look, I got to pause it and speak on it before I go any further. Um, it's always a sad case when, you know, kids are being abused at home. They got an abusive parent and then they run away to flee, you know, flee that abuse only to be caught by uh, law enforcement and brought back home into that situation yet again. Um, I saw it myself growing up with some of my own family members. The abusiveness might not have been to this extent, but, you know, there was some abuse there. And you see the kids continue to run away from home over and over and over and over again, only to be brought back. And the police or, you know, um, Child Protective Services not looking into it to find out why that is. It's, 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 it's sad. It's unfortunate, especially when they're teenagers, too. It's almost like they get over their issues get overlooked. They assumed it had to be some sort of genetic condition, so they put her name into the medical database, but nothing came up. Her name wasn't listed. And so this was very perplexing because everybody's name was in this database. And so they took her name and they ran it in other medical databases, and her name didn't show up in any of them. And so totally confused by this girl who seemingly didn't exist, who was exhibiting symptoms of a condition none of the doctors had seen before, the doctors decide they have to speak to the guy she showed up with, an older man who was out in the waiting room. When the doctors approached him, he said he was Kirsten's grandfather, but beyond that, he offered virtually no new information. In fact, he was aggressive and rude and dismissive, and anytime they asked him questions, he would answer as minimally as possible. And when the Clearly, Clarissa, you done dropped off a $100 dono. I'm glad you're having such a great day, a great hump day. We're trying to get through it, man. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing okay. I could be better, but I'm doing all right. Um, I'm hanging out with my folks, chilling, having a good time. Doctors really fixated on whether or not Kirsten had some underlying medical condition. He would not give them an answer. He would just dismiss it and say he didn't know anything. But it was the doctor's impression that he did know something. He just didn't want to tell them. Right. And this behavior shocked them because they're thinking the information he has could potentially save his granddaughter's life. Why wouldn't he want to give it to us? And so after... Hmm... <sighs> You know what I'm thinking happened, and I could be this could I could be reaching. I'm thinking that this girl could potentially be the daughter of the other girl that ran away, but maybe they had her um, had a natural birth at home and never put that child through the system. So that child is not in any database because that child never went through a hospital and. And, and you know, got a birth certificate or that type of stuff. After this disastrous interaction with the grandfather, the doctors decide to get the police involved. There were just too many red flags not to. When the police arrived, they were surprised to find out that this older man in the waiting room was none other than Joseph, the father of the still missing girl, Elizabeth. The Interesting. I thought for a second that it could have been Joseph the abusive father. So who would this granddaughter be? Would the granddaughter also be his daughter? Daughter slash granddaughter? Police ask Joseph, what's going on here? And he tells them that earlier that day, he had opened his front door of his house and lying on his front step was a girl he had never seen before. It was Kirsten. And there was a note laying on her from his missing daughter, Elizabeth. In the note, Elizabeth writes to Joseph directly and tells him, this girl here is Kirsten and she is my daughter. So she's your granddaughter and she's sick and I can't take care of her. Can you and mom take her to the hospital? While the police had many more questions about this totally what? bizarre turn of events. Wait, what? I thought they said this girl was like 19 years old. They realized that for the time being, they needed to focus their efforts on just getting Elizabeth to contact them because they yes. needed to know more about Kirsten's medical condition so they could save her life. And so the police went to the media and they put out a message on TV and on radio that was a direct appeal to Elizabeth that basically said, we need you to come forward as soon as possible and speak to us so we can help save your daughter's life. Wow. And all the messages worked because a week later, Elizabeth, a along week. with her father, Joseph, showed up at the hospital where Kirsten was staying. 
When doctors asked, Joseph did not get into detail about how he actually located Elizabeth. He simply said he found her and now she wants to see her daughter. The doctors noticed that Elizabeth, who was supposed to be in her early 40s, looked like she could easily be in her 60s. Her hair was completely white and her skin was so pale it was almost transparent, just like they had noticed about her daughter's skin. And so after they checked in, Nah, man, something's not right here. Something's not, what? This girl's supposed to be in her early 40s, but look like she's in her 60s, and her skin is just as pale as her daughter's skin. The father didn't state how he found his daughter. Something's not right. I almost feel like the father might have been, um, he might have kept this girl captured somewhere. He might have hid her somewhere in all these years. It, it, it has to be it because the girl has not had any sunlight. Maybe he, what? Neither, what? The thoughts are in my head, but I can't verbalize them right now. Joseph and Elizabeth made their way to Kirsten's room and the pair went inside and the doctors that were in there would say that Elizabeth looked terrified. She was hunched over and kind of slouched down and she wouldn't make eye contact with any of the doctors. And as she was standing there looking at her terribly sick daughter, the doctors began asking her, do you know of any underlying health problems your daughter might have that might help us treat her more effectively? And Elizabeth was so scared she couldn't even talk. I'm telling y'all, the father, he had his daughter and his granddaughter who was probably his child as well. He had them held captured somewhere. And this girl is so terrified of people because she hasn't been around people in 20 years that she can't really do much in this case. She wouldn't know of any underlying health conditions that her child has because they've been probably in a shed or something somewhere for 20 years. And the father's just been throwing food at them. And that girl is so terrified of her dad. That's why she doesn't know how to conduct herself around people. She's afraid of what she may say. That may cause her dad to do something to her. I bet you that's the case. And at some point, the questions became too much for her. And she just turned around and walked out into the hall with Joseph. And once they got out into the hall, the police were waiting for them. They had been tipped off as soon as the doctors saw Joseph and Elizabeth come into the hospital. Elizabeth and Joseph were detained and brought to the police station where they were put in two separate rooms to be interviewed. They first interviewed Elizabeth. And initially, just like in the hospital room, she was totally mute and didn't say anything. Then for five hours, the police grilled her with questions. Where had she been for the last 24 years? What 24. happened to Kirsten? Did she have something to do with her illness? And they kept reminding her throughout these five hours that if she never gave them any information and God forbid something were to happen to Kirsten, she, Elizabeth, could be held criminally liable. Mm -hmm. And so eventually Elizabeth in a very small, meek voice said, okay, I'll tell you the story, but you have to promise me I never have to see my father, Joseph, ever again. When she mm -hmm. said this to the police, they could tell she was so scared yes. that they said, okay, fine. You never have to see your father again. We'll make sure of it. Oh my gosh. I'm pretty sure, because I can feel it myself. I'm pretty sure the emotion that that girl felt when she stated what she said, I will tell you, but please, I must never see my father again. And when they said, okay, you never have to see your father again, I'm pretty sure like she had this this weight lifted off of her shoulders because i have a strong feeling and i could be wrong that what she's about to tell them is what i thought and tell us what happened after that elizabeth clutched her hands she took a deep breath and then she told them one of the most horrifying stories they had ever heard this may be worse than i could have imagined a story so disturbing that it would make headlines all around the world for months. Woo! 
Ooh, I don't know if I'm ready for this. It all began 24 years earlier on August 28, 1984, the day Elizabeth went missing. On that day, she told police she was at her family home in Amstetten when her father asked her to come into the basement to help him with something. Her father, for the last several years, had been constructing a bomb shelter in their basement, and he was now only one door installation away from being done. At the time, in the early 1980s, the Cold War was still very much on, and so building bomb shelters inside of your home was a relatively common thing. So Elizabeth goes down into her basement and she sees her father standing in front of this empty frame where this door is going to go that leads into the shelter. And so she walks over and steps through the frame into the shelter. She turns around and her father hands her this door and she holds it in the middle of the frame while he secures it to the hinges. And then once it's securely in place, suddenly he swings open the door, knocking Elizabeth backwards farther into the shelter. And before she could stand back up again, her father had run inside and pushed an ether-soaked towel onto her face, knocking her unconscious. When she came to again, she found herself chained up in the very back room of the shelter. It would turn out this bomb shelter that Joseph had spent six years constructing was not actually a bomb shelter. It was a prison he was building specifically for Elizabeth. To get This man had been building a prison. I told you guys he had her captured. I knew it. It took him six years to construct this. He had this much rage and hatred in his heart for his own daughter that he went the extra mile for six years to make this prison for her. Evil. Into the shelter, you would have to go down the steps into the basement, which looked like a typical unfinished basement. And then on the far wall, you would see these shelves that had things like paint cans and screwdrivers and other tools you would expect to find in a basement. But if you walked over to the left side of the shelving, there was a lock on the back of it that if you undid it, the shelf itself would swing out like a door and then behind it on the wall would reveal a three foot tall secret door. This secret door was also locked, but not by a key lock. Instead, it was locked by a keypad lock that only Joseph had the code to. And since Joseph was an electrical engineer, he took great care in ensuring this lock never could be tampered with or destroyed. That thing was going to stay locked unless he unlocked locked it. When Joseph entered his code into the keypad, he could open that secret door and it would reveal the secret underground prison that was basically a winding maze of small rooms with ceilings that were too short to be able to stand up all the way in. If you walked through the secret door and actually entered into this prison, you would start by entering this soundproof narrow hallway that went on for several feet before it entered into this very small bathroom area where the bathroom was unbelievably cramped and there was no doors, there was no privacy. And then if you didn't stop in the bathroom this man really made a freaking prison for his daughter look at this i'm sorry you guys i'm starting to get emotional because i'm thinking did this man really impregnate his own daughter And for 19 years, his grandchild slash daughter lived like this. And never being able to see the outside world. For 19 years. That would be the most insane thing ever. Oh my God. That child, oh my God. And you just kept walking straight through that first hallway, you would reach another hallway that was totally soundproof and narrow. And at the end of that hallway, it would feed into a very small bedroom that was so small that it barely contained the one bed that was inside of it. And then off to the right side of that bedroom was another door that led into a similarly sized bedroom. All of the walls of this underground prison were made of thick reinforced concrete that combined with the soundproofing that Joseph had installed throughout the entire prison meant no one could hear Elizabeth's cries for help. Also, the inside of the prison was heavily monitored by Joseph's security system. So truly, Elizabeth had absolutely no privacy. She no. was completely trapped and the only way she was getting out was if her father freed her. For the first- You hear, I mean, that, oh my God. 
he's a he's a freaking electrical engineer. I'm pretty sure he had surveillance cameras and stuff in there so that he can monitor and watch this girl at his leisure to make sure that she doesn't do anything to harm herself. And probably doesn't even supply her with any tools to be able to do so. He's like, no, you will live here. For the rest of your life. This is insane. Five years of her imprisonment, she remained in that dungeon all alone. Her only connection to the outside world was her father, who would come down almost every night to drop off basic supplies and to assault her. As far as Joseph's wife and his other kids knew, he was just spending all this time in the basement because that's where he worked when he was not at the office. In 1988, Elizabeth became pregnant with her father's child. She was terrified of the pregnancy and begged Joseph to at least allow her to deliver the child in the hospital. My initial assumption was correct. His grandchild is also his own child. It's hard to, fa you know, people have stories as adults of what their parents did to them and how their parents messed them up, messed them up. But this, this is a whole other level. But he refused. He wasn't willing to potentially expose himself for what he was doing. And so he gave her a book about childbirth and he gave her a pair of scissors to cut the umbilical cord. And he said, good luck. And so on August 30th, Elizabeth delivered her daughter, Kirsten, alone in that basement. Could you imagine that? Can you put yourself there for a second? This girl then got impregnated by her father and her father wouldn't even be there for the birth of his child slash grandchild. Just gave her a book on pregnancy and a pair of scissors to cut to cut her own umbilical cord. That's insane. What if this girl bled out? What if this girl had um, uh, difficulties with her pregnancy? Wow. Following the birth of Kirsten, Elizabeth would deliver six more of her father's children. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Of course. Not for a second did I think that one pregnancy was going to happen. Of course he's going to keep on molesting her. Of course she's going to keep getting pregnant. She delivered six... Oh my God. This is one of the most, if not the most disturbing thing I've ever heard a parent do to a child, their own child. This man needs to be put under the jail. Y'all, I'm over here tearing up because I can't believe this story. I can't believe someone would do this to anyone, let alone their own child. All the same way she delivered Kirsten, alone and in the basement. 
In 19... And every last child she delivered alone in that basement by herself. In 96, one of Elizabeth's newborn babies, Michael, was born with respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. And so Elizabeth pleaded with Joseph to take the baby to the hospital to get help, but Joseph refused. He was worried he would be exposed. And so three days after his birth, the baby died in Elizabeth's arms. And after the baby died, Joseph just took the body, threw it in a stove, and incinerated it like it was nothing. In the late 90s, the si The stories just keep getting worse. See, when there's one thing that <laughs> that kind of I don't even know how to say it. You got Mr. Ball in here who is capable of doing a very good job at telling stories and then you have someone like me who can visualize so clearly almost as if I'm watching a movie inside of my head that's why I'm getting so emotional because I can see this stuff I've seen what this man the father looks like I've seen what the daughter looks like I can animate them so clearly in my head and watch the acts as they unfold I saw that child die from respiratory issues. I saw that father take that baby and put him in that oven. I saw all of that. This man is evil. It's just like he has this person that is his puppet that he can do with at his leisure, who is also his daughter, who he has a horrible relationship with. But he's thinking, hell, look, I'm the master mind of this, of this situation that I've created. I can do with her as I please. As far as the rest of the world is concerned, she ran away from home and there's nowhere to be found. She will die here. But before she does, I will have my way with her. Whenever I like, however I like. This is some of the most disturbing mess I've ever seen in my life. Six living children down in the basement were getting bigger and noisier, and so Joseph came up with a plan in order to reduce the chances of them being discovered. And so one day, Joseph went downstairs into the basement, and he took one of Elizabeth's youngest children away from her. And then he threatened her and the rest of the kids down there that if they tried to fight back or if they ever tried to escape, he would seal off the basement and he would gas them to death. Previously, Joseph had punished the entire family by turning off their power and cutting off their food and water supply for multiple days at a time. So It just keeps getting worse. I'm over here thinking about this girl, the daughter, the first daughter, thinking about what could possibly have been going through her head during this entire ordeal. Here she is. She has multiple children by her father. What is the real relationship with her and each one of those individual kids? How does she feel about them? How does she really feel about them? Does she nurture them like a mother would? Or does she have hatred in her heart for each one of those kids that she didn't ask for? She didn't ask for a single one of them. That confined space was already too small for her. Now she has seven children that are living in there with her that know nothing else about the outside world other than her who has experienced it. Wow. It's almost as if he's like, hey, look, I can either keep you all alive or end you if I want.
They knew he was willing and able to hurt them if he wanted to. And so when he took this young child away from Elizabeth, they didn't put up a fight and the baby disappeared upstairs. And when Joseph's wife, Rosemary, came home, he put on this elaborate charade about how he had discovered this baby on the front step and that there was a note attached to the baby and it was from Elizabeth, their missing daughter, and this child was apparently Elizabeth's and she couldn't take care of it and she was leaving it here for he and Rosemary to raise it as their own. And Joseph had actually made Elizabeth write out this note and sign it to add credibility to the story. And so when Elizabeth's mother, Rosemary, saw this note and heard Joseph's story, she believed it. Over the next several years, Joseph would steal two more of Elizabeth's young children and then stage having found them on his front step with a note from Elizabeth. And with each discovered child, Rosemary amazingly never asked any questions. She just took these kids in and she and Joseph raised them as their own. Eventually, when these three kids got old enough, Rosemary is stupid. This man's wife is stupid. I hate to say that. I hate to say that. But either she's dumb or he's extremely good at what it is that he's doing. This manipulation tactic. Either he's really, really good or she's really, really dumb. Or maybe really gullible and just believes her husband. That might be it. She might not be stupid. What? I wonder. He keeps taking these other kids in that are his kids. He didn't ever think that maybe for a second that those kids will tell the truth. Joseph would tell them that their real mother, Elizabeth, was a low life and she had abandoned. Yeah, that was the other thing, um, Yanni, that I was going to say too. Rosemary was probably abused as well. And the first initial thought I had too when I thought about her was that it's a possibility that he got with her knowing how gullible she is. Like he's abusing everyone from the beginning. them as their own. Eventually, when these three kids got old enough, Joseph would tell them that their real mother, Elizabeth, was a lowlife and she had abandoned them and she didn't care about them, when in reality, their mother and their other three siblings they didn't know existed were locked up in the basement below their feet. Ah, okay. So he took them when they were young, young, young. So they, they couldn't tell. They couldn't tell the story because... The story that he told them about their their mother was different than act, the actual truth. Now, I saw this happen in my own family. I don't want to give away too much detail, but I saw people that were very close to me be told one story about their original parents or then their biological parents. Then that was the truth. That wasn't the truth. I'll go ahead and say it. My aunt told my nieces or my cousins I should say that their mother was a low life that she was this that she was that and maybe some of it was true but not all of it there was a lot of lies being told Initially, investigators believed all of these children Joseph had with Elizabeth were all mistakes, but it would turn out that was not the case. Joseph would admit that the reason he initially imprisoned Elizabeth was because he wanted to completely control her. He wanted to own her. Yep. And so he decided that if he could just impregnate her as many times as possible and make her have all these kids, even if she eventually got out of the prison, no man would want her. She had too many kids, and so she would remain his property. And so over the entire time Elizabeth was imprisoned, over two decades, the nightly assaults by her father never slowed down. They happened thousands of times. But despite the horrific and tragic circumstances surrounding each of her children's births, she loved her children unconditionally and would spend all of her time doing her best to educate them and care for them. The three children that remained with her that were not taken by Joe. That, that was the answer to my question right there. What was her 
relationship with her children. You know, that makes that makes sense. I'm glad that she went that route to love her kids unconditionally, to care for them, to to raise them, to teach them. I love that she went that route. Um, not only was it beneficial to her children, but it was also beneficial to the overall mental well-being for herself. Joseph, she taught them how to read and how to write. And when Joseph had given them a TV and a radio to keep down there, she would use those two items to try to teach her kids about the outside world, and she would promise them that someday they would get to experience it for real. Finally, in 2008, mm. so 20, 24 years, after Elizabeth had originally been captured by her father, her oldest daughter, Kirsten, becomes extremely sick. And Elizabeth convinces Joseph to bring her to the hospital. And one week later, Joseph's heinous crimes were revealed to the world. Once police... There he is. There he is. He looks like one of these type of people that if you were to see him in public, out in public one day, you would look at him and you would just have this overwhelming feeling of this man has done some evil things in his life. He has this look about him. Tell me he doesn't. I feel like if I would have saw him in public, I would just mean mud the hell out of him. Because my gut would tell me he has done some things. Put him under the jail. Put this monster under the jail. found out about the secret prison, they rushed to the house and they went downstairs and they used the codes and instructions that Joseph had given them and they went inside and they freed the last two remaining children that were still there. When they brought them to the hospital, the youngest of these two kids, who was five years old, he didn't speak the entire time. He just pressed his face up against the glass of the car window and he stared out in utter amazement because to that point in his life, he had never actually seen the world. After those two kids were brought to the hospital, they were reunited with the other three siblings that had been taken away from them years ago to live upstairs with Joseph and Rosemary. And apparently the reunion was very emotional and the kids were extremely happy to see each other. And then a couple days later, Kirsten would come out of her coma and she too would have a chance to be reunited with all of her siblings. Kirsten would ultimately make a full recovery. It would turn out she was suffering from a severe vitamin D deficiency and vitamin D you primarily get from the sun, and in her 19 years of life, she had never been in the sun. Damn. I'm surprised that wouldn't have been their initial thought in regards to what was wrong with her. Um, vitamin D deficiency, of course, obviously, probably the rest of the kids, had they continued to spend that much time down there in that basement, then they would have succumbed to that same... Um, um, ordeal. Damn. I'm glad that she had a full recovery. I'm glad that they realized what the issue was. But man, this story is mind blowing. As soon as the story broke about this family being trapped inside of this basement, everybody had the same question. How could Elizabeth's mother, Rosemary, not know what was going on in her basement? But the police had the same suspicions about Rosemary, and they investigated her, and they ruled her out. And they said she's not at fault here, she's a victim too. She had been so badly abused by Joseph that she lived in fear of him. And so when he forbade her from ever going anywhere near the basement... Of course. Not for a second did I, did I not think that she was a victim as well. If this man could control his daughter and what's going on in that basement in the way that he was, of course the same thing is happening with the wife. 
She moves in fear of this man. I knew that from the very start of this story. When they said that he would come home from work and the whole dynamic in the household would change, everyone would stiffen up and be ready to take a whooping. Of course, the wife was going to be one of those people too. They all lived in fear of him. I'm just glad that they was able to rule that out and not point a finger at her and worsen her situation, but to also free the wife as well. She listened, and if she ever heard any strange sounds coming out of the basement, or if she ever suspected any strange behavior by Joseph, she kept those thoughts to herself because she was scared. It's also worth noting that in those 24 years that Elizabeth and her kids were trapped in the basement, Joseph had over 100 people rent out a room inside of his house that was right over the basement. This man was airbnb in it. In those 24 years, not one of those tenants ever said Joseph was acting strangely or complained about strange noises coming from the basement. However, one tenant who was there for a four-year stretch had a dog with him the whole time, and every night, the dog at some point would suddenly stand up, its ears would prick up, and it would start growling like it heard or it saw something. And at first, this tenant would try to see what the dog had seen or heard, but after never seeing anything, he would always just dismiss the dog when it did this at night. That's amazing. This dude for 10 years was written out a room that was above this garage or whatever, I mean the basement, or at least in proximities of it, obviously on his property, and no one ever saw him go down there. Later on, when that tenant figured out what was actually happening inside the house while he was there, he realized his dog was most likely hearing the faint sounds of the family that was imprisoned right below him. After a year of therapy and rehabilitation, Elizabeth and her six kids were given new identities by the Austrian government, and they were sent off to a secret location to start their lives over. As such, there's virtually no information about how they're doing today. However, anonymous sources have come forward and said the family has successfully reintegrated into society, and they are all leading relatively normal and happy lives. Mm -hmm. As for Joseph, he was quickly given a life sentence, and today he is one of the most hated people in his prison due to the nature of his crimes. He should be one of the most hated in the world. He is so hated that in 2016, when he was out in general population, he was attacked by other inmates and had several of his teeth knocked out. I'm glad. And so now prison officials are worried if they leave him in general population, he'll be killed. And so he spends virtually all of his time in solitary confinement. Good. Throw him in there. Lock the door. Never never let him out. That's what he did to his daughter and kids for 25 years. Solitary confinement. Do the same to him for the rest of his life. As a matter of fact, give him 25 years. 24, whatever. No matter. Give it to him. Solitary confinement. Don't let him out amongst the, the general crowd in the prison. No, 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 no. He doesn't deserve that. Yeah, they might beat on him. That's good, too. But lock him in there. Solitary confinement. And then send a big dude in there to have his way with him every now and then. <laughs> I'm serious. An eye for an eye, right? This story is insane. He will be eligible for parole in 2024 when he is 89 years old. So that's 89 years old. No, 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 no. Don't let him out. Put him under the jail. Gonna do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment section. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button over to your house for a family dinner party and proceed to serve them a significantly oversalted dish. All right, y'all, I gotta go. I gotta get out of here. I need to watch something happy now, but I ain't got time. I'm already about to be late from where I'm going. But anyway, y'all know what time it is. If you like this reaction, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more. As always, the link to the originals will be down in the description box below. If you haven't already, make sure you follow your boy on the gram and Twitter and all the kicks. Love you guys. 
I'll see y'all later. Peace.